last class I had uh, discussed about the polarographic uh, uh, half wave potential and I told you that the EMF or current uh, would be EMF can be expressed in the form of current that is E is equal to E half plus 0 0.0591 divided by n log of I d minus I by I when I is, I, I is equal to I d by 2 then we have E half E is equal to e, e half dash. So, it follows that I d minus I by I if I plot it against uh, the potential of the micro electrode a straight line with a slope of 0 0.0591 by n is obtained where n is the number of electrons involved in the reaction a reduction. So, the intercept of the graph upon the vertical axis gives the half wave potential of the system. So, th that can be recorded and it has been recorded for many elements uh, including organic species which can be reduced or oxidized. So, n can be determined simply by the slope of the uh, curve L calibration curve. E half is also known as decomposition potential the wave should be steeper for aluminum and lanthanum than lead or cadmium than alkali metals or thales ion. So, if the reaction at the indicator electrode involves complexation then satisfactory polar graphs can be obtained only if the dissociation of the complex ion is very rapid compared to the diffusion rate so that the concentration of the sample ion is maintained constant at the electrode interface. So, if uh, for example, if I take a complex uh, metal ion like this m x p raised to n minus p b and then uh, this can dissociate to give you metal ion followed by the ligand and uh, uh, this we have already discussed. So, it is only sort of recapitulation for you then we can uh, calculate k instability con instability constant using this expression uh, m n plus into x raise to b minus whole raise to p that is the products divided by reactants. So, we can write a reduction potential something like this m x p raised to n minus p b plus plus n number of electrons with in presence of mercury it will form metal amalgam and the ligand will be freed. And so, I can write E half is equal to E naught dash minus 0 0.0591 by n and log of k instability minus of 0 0.0591 by n log of x b x raised to b minus and that is raised to p. So, p is the coordination number of the complex ion formed and that also can be determined and uh, here x is the complexing agent. So, the more stable the complex ion more negative will be the half wave potential that means, it is more difficult to decompose. So, there will be a shift of the E half, e half values by complexation. Copper in the nickel, lead, etcetera can be complexed with cyanide ions, and then uh, nickel and lead, etcetera also can be determined in this way. So, normally. the analyte should be of the order of about 10 raise to minus 4 to minus 3 molar and the volume of the solution is between 2 and 25 ml. However, it is not uncommon to come across 10 raise to minus 2 molar as well as 10 raise to minus 8 molar solutions. So, reproducibility of the duplicate analysis may be plus or minus 2 percent. So, saturated solutions of the Ox of oxygen at ambient temperature give two waves corresponding according to the reactions O 2 plus 2 H 2 O 
plus 2 e going to H 2 O 2. The other one is uh, O 2 plus 2 H plus plus 2 e going to water that is in acidic solutions. So, the second wave is H 2 O 2 plus 2 electrons that goes to alkaline solution and then H 2 O 2 plus 2 H plus 2 E goes to 2 H 2 O. So, oxygen needs to be removed by passing nitrogen through the analyte it is a must. Further 0 0.5 percent so gelatin should be added to remove the appearance of the maxima. So, if the E half differ by at least 0 0.4 units um, we can determine uh, number of elements whose E half differ by 0 0.4 units if it is a univalent ion the sodium, lithium, potassium etcetera, thallium, cop, cuprous uh, all those uh, univalent ions, but if it is a divalent ion then the E half should at least differ by 0 0.2 volts and they uh, such things can be easily determined. Sometimes E half overlap each other then complexation can be employed to displace them to more negative potentials this, that is the use of complexation. So, precipitation, electrolytic deposition etcetera many other chemical techniques can be used to advantage if complex analysis has to be carried out. Nickel, zinc etcetera in pure copper salt can be dissolved in ammonia solutions that is uh, uh, you can even dissolve it in NH4Cl etcetera and electrolyzed at about minus 0.7 volts versus SCE. So, then we can determine zinc and nickel. So, as less as 0 0.00001 percent nickel can be determined in this way. So, the beauty of uh, uh, polarography is in the lower limit of the detection limit here I have shown you only for nickel, but for many other elements also they will be in the similar range. So, what do we how do we go about the quantitative analysis very simple basically all you have to do is draw i d minus i by i curve keep on adding your uh, um, increasing the voltage at some stage it will start decomposing and then you start measuring the current. So, the current versus voltage curve will give you the curve which will tell you the concentrations. So, the I d minus i versus uh, concentration should give you a calibration plot just like in spectrophotometry or something. So, whatever is the current generated would give you the concentration of the unknown. So, there are two or three methods that can be used for quantitative analysis and uh, some of them are very standard. Here I am showing you wave height concentration plot. So, here what we do? We prepare different standards and determine the polarograms using maximum supporting electrolyte and maxima suppressor. Then all we got to do is plot the wave height versus concentration and also run a an unknown sample that is your analyte and you can read the concentration of the unknown prepared in the same way by referring to the calibration curve very simple technique and we can also use bracketing techniques. So, what is a bracketing technique? A bracketing technique is you concentrate you choose particular uh, concentration work only in that concentration. So, if the your sample is having very high concentration of the analyte you dilute it and then do the analysis if it is dilute you will have to find ways and means of concentrating the solution. So, 
this is one method that is wave height versus concentration plot and then we can have a pilot ion method. Here what we do is the relative diffusion current of the ions in the same supporting electrolyte usually they are independent of the characteristics of capillary yeah, and, the, and the electrode and temperature. So, we determine the relative wave height of the unknown and some standard or pilot ion known to us is added in known amounts and we compare the ratio for known amounts of same two ions. This procedure is limited to applications with minimum 0.2 volts difference for the ions under investigation. So, this is also fairly simple method, but uh, there is one more technique that is more accurate that is known as method of standard deviation, standard addition not deviation. So, here what we do is I determine the polarogram of the unknown solution and then I add a known amount of the same ion to the same cell and recording record a second polarogram. I take the sample and then add one more uh, some more of the known analyte record the polarogram then record the polarogram of the unknown also. So, now I have two curves two values that is um, unknown if there is a diffusion current of I 1 in volume V of the solution of concentration C u and for uh, the standard solution I get another current some other uh, value that is I 2 that is the diffusion current after V m l of standard solution of concentration C s is added. And then basically what we do is uh, we take the uh, unknown run a polarogram then take the same quantity of unknown in another set add a known volume of a standard to the unknown matrix and then run the polarogram. So, it has to be actually higher than the previous one standard the analyte alone, but we do not know what is the analyte concentration. So, but the we have the total unknown plus known concentration is added uh, that current value we have. So, I can write the you look at the last equation here I can write I 1 is equal to k into C u where k is the proportionality constant and what would be I 2? I 2 would be the sum of the uh, currents corresponding to known volume of the unknown Okay, volume we know concentration we do not know plus I am adding a v volume of the unknown. So, the total volume would be small v plus v here I have written it at the denominator here. So, the I 2 current diffusion current is a is in direct proportion to the concentrations of the unknown and the standard in a volume of V plus V capital V and small v. So, just like that uh, I can write K I 2 is equal to K into capital V into C u that is unknown and then small v into C s that is known, but there is a, we are taking here the dilution factor that is V plus V. So, the co actual concentration would be not the same as what we have taken alone, but as a mixture. So, I write I 2 is equal to k into V C u plus V small v C s divided by V plus V that is the concentration, Okay, total volume. So, 
k 2 I can solve it and write it as I 2 plus capital V by small v divided by V C u plus small v into C s and I can write I can calculate what is C u using this expression that is I 1 into small v C s divided by I 2 minus I 1 multiplied by capital V and small v total volume plus I 1 v. This is a very simple derivation though you do not have to worry too much about the number about the equation, but uh, it is a uh, it is described in most of the textbooks. So, I can you can look it up in case you get confused while listening to this standard edition method, uh, but it is widely practiced everywhere. Here one advantage is the matrix the standard what you add is going to be added to the in the to the same matrix that the unknown is. So, standard is also subjected to the same kind of interference from the other matrix components. So, the accuracy of the method depends upon the precision with which the two volumes of the solutions and corresponding IDs are measured. So, here we make the assumption that the wave height is a linear function of the concentration in the range of concentration what we are measuring. So, we do not say it will be linear in every concentration range, but we should be careful. So, best results are obtained when wave height is approximately doubled by the standard addition. So, it is a fairly simple technique and uh, standard addition I suggest you go through some textbooks and other things there is nothing much to add except that if you understand the terms capital V, small v, v, c u etcetera the derivation of unknown is also a very simple process. So, this is how we do the wave height measurement. Suppose, I have a polarogram here, um, polarogram here this is the residual current and then wave height here it goes and then I draw a tangent here and tangent here. So, this is first ion this is first ion plus second ion. So, this is for the supporting electrode that is the normal uh, this thing. So, I this is the decomposition potential versus SCE standard saturated calomel electrode and it can be easily carried out the analysis of unknown there are electrochemical laboratories which who do polarography on a large scale day in and day out. So, it is not very uncommon for people to work on polarography. So, that completes our uh, discussion on polarography, but we will continue our discussion now on Carl Fisher titrations. This is a very interesting behavior a very interesting analysis that permits the determination of water in a given compound. So, what is Carl Fisher titration? For the determination of small amounts of Carl of water Carl Fisher German scientist proposed a reagent prepared by the action of sulfur dioxide upon iodine dissolved in pyridine and methyl alcohol. So, what I do? I dissolve the iodine in pyridine add methyl alcohol and then start uh, the titration and determine the water content. How what is the basic uh, chemistry involved here? It is very simple I have 3 molecules of C 5 H 5 N that is pyridine I am adding iodine, I am adding SO2 and if there is water in the sample all of them are going to give me a an inner complex 
C phi H phi N H plus I minus this is a salt and C phi H phi N S O 2 minus N plus S O 2 minus this will react with methanol to give you C phi H phi N and O S O 2 O C H 3 this is uh, uh, methanol reacting with S O 2 add addition compound and there is the hydrogen here this hydrogen comes here and o, o C H 3 comes here S O 2 is here. So, this one part is S O 2 and this part will become O S O 2 O C H 3. So, this oxygen will be uh, O C H 3 will be added to this and nitro another part of the this methanol will be bonded to the nitrogen in the pyridine group. So, I have a compound like C 5 H 5 N H O S O 2 O C H 3. In the first step sulfur dioxide is oxidized by iodine and an intermediate compound pyridine sulfur trioxide is formed. This is uh, SO2 actually. So, C5 H5 and SO2 O3 that is sulfur trioxide and uh, that compound is the inner salt of pyridine and sulfonic acid. The second step is the formation of pyridinium methyl sulfate which prevents the pyridine complex from reacting with another molecule of water. See here in the previous step look at the second reaction all valencies are complete. So, there is no chance for further reaction. So, addition of uh, pyridine, uh, pyridine methyl sulfate prevents the pyridine complex from reacting with another molecule of water because there is no more pyridine and iodine and sulfur they are all not there at all. Uh, this is on molecular level. So, the original Carl Fischer ray that means the in Carl Fischer reaction I take pyridine, I take sulfur dioxide, iodine and methyl alcohol. If there is water in a given sample, it will react with Carl Fischer reagent one molecule will react with one molecule of pyridinium complex and that is the basis for water analysis. So, one water molecule if it is there it will react with the pyridinium complex. So, the original Carl Fischer reagent is prepared with excess of methanol which serves as a reactant as well as a diluent methanol is also a solvent. So, that will be done and uh, this reagent is somewhat unstable and needs frequent standardization. So, every time you want to do a Carl Fischer titration you have to standardize it with a substance of known concentration of water. There are many some such substances like that uh, with exact concentration of water in, present in the water of crystallization. So, uh, a more stable reagent we can prepare from ethylene glycol monomethyl ether that is also known as methyl cellozole which is an industrial chemical and it is prepared in millions of tons in the industry. So, when I prepare the reagent fresh it has a deep reddish brown color and uh, the one which is reacted with water and spent that is light yellow in color straw yellow color. 
So, you can even do the ordinary titration from deep reddish brown to straw yellow color and with experience one can determine exactly how much of water is there and uh, that water concentration will be in ppm parts per million. Okay. So, that it can be used as a direct titrant also if you are comfortable with change in the color from deep brown to light yellow. But the decomposed reagent also has a brownish color and the endpoint detection is slightly difficult. That is why I said uh, somebody should have experience in conducting uh, this kind of reaction. So, it is therefore, preferable to add a slight excess of the reagent and titrate the excess with a standard solution of water in methanol. I can prepare methanol also with known quantity of water because water and methanol are very easily miscible. So, the end point is determined normally by electrochemically usually not by visual titration. So, if a small EMF is applied across two platinum electrodes immersed in the reaction mixture a current will flow as long as free iodine is there to remove hydrogen and depolarize the electrode. So, when the last trace of iodine is removed what happens to the current? Current becomes 0 or very close to 0. Here uh, in this reaction iodine is there. So, this iodine uh, usually is usually prepared by in the presence of potassium iodide. So, the current uh, iodine uh, iodide will be there in this. So, so long as iodide is there potassium iodide and iodine are there the current will be passing through, but once all of it is consumed there will not be any addition of uh, uh, there will not be any addition of water of uh, current basically because I, I 2 plus I goes to I 3 minus which is a negative ion that carries the current. So, the second step is the formation of pyridinium methyl sulphate this I have already covered and uh, what I have here is I do have a excess of water in methanol slight standard addition. So, the uh, I know exactly what should be the end point with a standard methanol and then uh, that can be checked against the accuracy then you can determine the unknown by the same way titration or measurement of the electrode. So, the iodine when it becomes uh, totally consumed we have 0 or very close to 0 current. Conversely the technique may be combined with a direct titration of the sample with Carl Fischer reagent. In this case any excess of iodine causes the current to rise sharply. So, Carl Fischer reagent can be added excess then the current will increase. So, initially we will have a reducing current slowly it come becomes 0 and then any additional excess of the reagent if you add from the burette the current will start rising because we have I 3 minus ions excess. So, that will carry the current. So, it is it is a very sharp end point if you do the electrical uh, electrochemical titration. So, it is obviously a more elegant process method. So, the apparatus Carl Fischer uh, apparatus is also very simple it has got a 3 volt battery and uh, it has got a micrometer 500 ohm resistor 0.5 watt radio potentiometer etcetera. So, the potentiometer is set so that 
there is a potential drop off about approximately 80 millivolts across the electrode and does not require adjustment until the battery is exhausted. So, Carl Fischer reagent may be standardized using 5 to 6 milligram of water in methanol or you can use uh, pure disodium tartrate dihydrate that is uh, a very standard salt with a known concentration of water. So, this salt disodium tartrate dihydrate that is 2 molecules of water is there it contains approximately 15.66 percent of water. So, uh, if you get 15.66 percent water with uh, potassium uh, disodium tartrate then you can proceed with the unknown. So, what should be the value of uh, Carl Fischer reagent? It is in terms of it is in terms of uh, accuracy. It is in terms of accuracy that Carl Fischer titration can be carried out. Any unknown substance you want to determine water of crystallization or any of the water content in a given sample one has to determine. Such situations arise quite a lot in uh, day to day life especially in pharmaceutical industry etcetera where tablets are being made everybody wants to know what is the water content in that and whether it is hygroscopic or not hygroscopic, how long it can be kept in the open like that lot of information is required. So, Carl Fischer titration is a very standard technique in pharmaceutical industries. The apparatus is very simple you can buy it for about 6 to 8 thousand rupees with electrical uh, end point detection. So, the reagent may be applied to samples with the following requirement there are certain conditions which need to be fulfilled and uh, we will look at them in my next class. So, we will go ahead and see what are the conditions that need to be satisfied and also what are the interferences in Carl Fischer titration. Thank you very much, we will continue in our, our discussion in the next class.